Welcome back, everyone, to Decently and Decent episode 24. Let's go. Yeah, Today, guys, first of all, we got to start off with a salutary two-finger pour of the Jameson that we store in the Globe Decanter. Um, and as always, I want to say I appreciate you for joining in, whether it's on Storyfire, YouTube, Spotify, listening, watching, whatever it is. I'm excited for you to get to know me a little better. <laughs> I wish I could say I'm getting to know you guys better, but that's not how this thing works. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the internet. I want to, we're going to talk a little bit about misinformation, quote, unquote, adding air quotes to that. What that entails, some of the news that's come out this week between X and Brazil and some Zuckerberg news, uh, and just the, the overall idea of free speech, what that entails, is it important, and should we be trusting some sort of centralized organization to decide what we are allowed to see and consume. This is a bit of a heavy topic. Now, you know what? Heavy is maybe not the right word, but it's a highly debated topic. In my years on the internet, the free speech debate obviously has come up a lot because so much of our lives are lived on social media. And anytime somebody gets deplatformed or there's information, you, you know, the big one is obviously certain types of information may be being deranked because they aren't in the best interest of the people that own said platform, whether that's Google or Meta, um, formerly Twitter. Um, the big thing, obviously, in the last one to two years is the, the Twitter acquisition by Elon Musk, rebranding it to X, and now he's him and what feels like Mostly the conservative right wing is championing that as, you know, the last bastion of free speech. I, you know, I'm happy that he bought X, quite frankly, if I'm being honest, because, you know, I've spent a lot of time on social media. I've made a lot of content. I've spent years trying to monetize content on uh, on YouTube and been pretty successful at it. But I've run into a lot of difficulty around certain things, um, trying to get things monetized and not being able to just because they're borderline edgy or whatever. Now that's a whole separate conversation because there's a difference between like monetizing something with ads and then just the ability to even have an existence or a profile or say what you want on your platform of choice, right? The big news, the last couple of weeks was the fact that Brazil, their recent, I guess what people would call a socialist leader has banned X in Brazil. So you are no longer allowed to use um, X in Brazil. Certainly they're, uh, they're not the first country, obviously China, like there's, there's certain countries that are very, uh, selective and restrictive about what they allow their citizens to interact with on the internet. But in this particular case, Brazil was like, no, nope, you're, I, I don't know what the, like kind of the behind the closed doors situation was. Maybe there was some kind of beef between Elon and whoever the fucking new leader of Brazil is. I don't follow a lot of this kind of global politics shit. But this idea that you're a Brazilian resident and you maybe enjoy going on X and disseminating and consuming information, whatever that might be, you get your news from there. However you feel about the platform, whether you think it leans a certain way or whether you think the algorithm favors uh, progressive or, 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 or conservative, I think it's obvious that since Elon bought it, it feels um, like conservatives view X as like, like I said earlier, the last bastion of hope for free speech and then Democrats uh, and progressives are just constantly complaining about it. I think I, I, I appreciate its utility. I think it's important. I'm glad that it exists. I don't think it's necessarily the healthiest thing for me spending or just anyone in general to spend too much time on there because I think it's easy to go down some rabbit holes that might be a bit of an echo chamber because of the way algorithms work. And it's just constantly pumping you with things that you interact with. And it can be it can be a dangerous game if you're not being judicious about how much content you consume without making sure you are giving yourself a balanced counterpoint somewhere else, whatever that looks like. But I appreciate that it exists. You know, I used to use Twitter a lot years ago in my early kind of social media journey. It's actually the first platform where I really, ex I really gained a little bit of a following. Uh, many of you don't know this in 2000 maybe 16 ish before I was even, you know, making commentary YouTube videos. I was on Twitter and I was making these little short videos of me kind of 
I guess, raging out over silly things in a, in a way that was supposed to be comedic and would reply, you know, just generated a little bit of buzz, got some followers. And that, that little buzz I created on Twitter was what helped kickstart my YouTube channel and helped me break a thousand views on my first couple videos when I was starting to make YouTube content back in the day. So Twitter holds a special place in my heart for that reason. But also as it's, you know, gone through so many different iterations over the years and it's now been acquired by Elon and turned into what it is today for better or worse, you know, it's definitely a different platform than it was before Elon owned it. A lot of people say, and I say this a lot too, it's like, oh, it's like I can barely log on to Twitter without seeing like a, a fight in school, without seeing someone get killed. It just feels like all the nastiest shit constantly rising to the top. Why am I feeding myself with all of this stuff? But the fucked up part of that is algorithms are oftentimes a reflection of human behavior. So if those are the things that are constantly being served to people, it's a reflection of those things are the things that people are most interested in, in a kind of a fucked up way, or not even a fucked up way, just in a, in an, in an innate human way. When you see something outrageous or explicit or violent, as much as we want to, you know, as much as we want to pretend like we're good and pure in, 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 in holy in God fearing, a lot of people still click and watch that shit. You know, even if it, even if you don't like it, even if it makes you feel bad, there's this innate curiosity as a human that makes us do it. And then it kind of creates this, this feed of these things that are feeding that innate curiosity that doesn't feel very healthy, but it, you know, algorithms are a reflection of the users oftentimes. It, you know, it, because, you know, I, I genuinely, I don't think, you know, and people argue, people argue one way or the other. I don't think Elon's like sitting in an office like, yes, yeah, let's only show, let's only show conservative content and we'll, we'll, we'll derank the democratic content. I think, he, I think he is, is whatever you have to say or you think about him, he's obviously a genius in many ways, whatever his political leanings aside. He's just a, the pure blood entrepreneur, kind of like the, the, the one in a million type that's able to, to, to work at the scale that he does and make the type of things that he does. Um, a lot of people don't like to admit that, but there's not many people like that. So whether you hate him or you love him, you have to, I think I would like to least think you can respect what he's been able to do as one as a human, which is, you know, 100,000 times more than what I'll ever be able to do in my lifetime on kind of like a production level. But uh, I think he genuinely wants a platform to be, I think he wants things to be fair. I think he is a, a an actual, an actual uh, bastion or, or, advocate for free speech through and through. So I think that there's definitely kind of like an audience capture where like X has really captured that conservative audience because of that talking point. So it might feel like if you're on there, that's a lot of the stuff that you see because I don't know, maybe I imagine like, you know, it's just your Republican guy spends his time on X and all your like stay at all your all the wives are at home scrolling Instagram, which is like, <laughs> which is the opposite. Although I will say lately, some of the Instagram comments I've seen have been getting pretty spicy. Instagram comments, let me tell you, have gotten pretty spicy. When you're talking about like PC, um, you know, trying to walk in between the lines and not be offensive. Instagram line, Instagram comments have been pushing the envelope recently and I love to see it because I'm, because I, I just want it all to exist. I'm not, I'm the, I for me personally, I am, I'm against any sort of censoring of things that are uncomfortable because we think we can create this safe world. The reality is humanity is very unsafe. Humans in general are by and large sick and disgusting. And I think there's obviously certain measures that can be taken to maybe try and protect younger people or kids or whatever and what they consume online. But this idea that we can just ignore the nasty sides of humanity and pretend they don't exist. And, you know, well, we don't like this thing, what these people are saying. So we're just going to, we're just going to delete them and their ability to have an opinion. That feels very wrong to me. And that all kind of boils down to, to the free speech debate. And I'm not a debater. I'm not the most eloquent person in the world. I'm just a dude who, I, I imagine I'm not so different than than you listening, if I had to guess. Like, 
I consider myself pretty down to earth. I'm not hyper intelligent. I've been able to have success at a couple of things I've tried. I have a decent vocabulary, thankful to, you know, thank, thanks to my mother in the years I homeschooled. But like, I'm not over here trying to make this great case. I just think as a pleb, looking from the top down, this idea that, you know, a government, in this case, Brazil, is like, hey, we're not a big fan of some of the things that are being said about whatever it is about us, about our country or about this politics, that politics on this platform, this platform that is generally advocates for free speech and for people to be able to say what they say, what they believe. Yeah, we don't like that stuff. So we're just going to make it illegal to use. And not only that, they were basically like, uh, also, if you try to, if you use X, there's, we're going to fine you $9,000 an hour. This is a tweet I saw in the, in, uh, also if you use a VPN, they're basically threatening. Like if you use a VPN, we'll fit, you know, we'll figure it out. So there's a $9,000 an hour fine for using X. Meanwhile, the average annual income in Brazil is $6,000, which is very curious. Um, you know, in this person, you know, this guy tweeting, uh, yeah, why don't we just take away their ability to read the news and then tell them it's to protect democracy? In the corollary, a lot of the talk has been about this. Is like, okay, you see it happening in Brazil and you're like, oh, this type of thing could never happen in the United States, right? And it's like, well, sure it could. Of course it could. And there's been clips recently. I'm curious what you think about this one. There was a, a clip from Kamala recently talking to the talking about the DOJ and if she gets elected, how she wants to essentially censor and, I don't know, get rid of X, whatever it is. And we'll put the Department of Justice of the United States back in the business of justice. We will double the Civil Rights Division and direct law enforcement to counter this extremism. We will hold social media platforms accountable for the hate infiltrating their platforms because Mm, that that see that's a loaded that how do you well I, I'll get into that in a minute but let's go on because they have a responsibility to help fight against this threat to our democracy what threat is and that if you profit off of is that my, see my question is like what what threat to your democracy is that to, to your democracy are you speaking of is that a threat of people that don't align with you ideologically that wouldn't vote for you? Like what, what is that threat necessarily? This is my biggest problem with politics is that it can't just be like contrarian views. It's more like, Hey, if you don't, if you're not with us, you're a threat to democracy. And it's kind of at the point where both sides feel that way about each other. And it feels very bleak. Let's go on. Hate. If you act as a megaphone for misinformation mm. or cyber warfare, if you don't police your platforms, we are going to hold you accountable mm -hmm. as a community. Interesting word. Misinformation for me has always been the word of the day. Okay. Misinformation. You've heard that word. You've seen it parroted by politicians by people that are upset about things that they see online that they don't agree with. If this isn't in the camp that I'm comfortable with, it's probably misinformation. We have to hold these social media outlets responsible for their users disseminating misinformation, okay? This is a very hairy situation because on one hand, certainly there is a lot of absolutely fucking low IQ morons on social media that are constantly coming up with bullshit, conspiracy theory, nonsense, posting shit that's not true, trying to amplify it. And a lot of times some of this stuff lives healthfully, you know, and moves around the internet with a mind of its own. And you're eventually it's like, okay, this, no, that never should have had legs, but it did. It got legs because it's the internet. And a lot of times people see something ridiculous and they just want to believe it, whether or not it's true. But the problem is, who decides what is misinformation, all right? Are you, if you get elected president, I mean, you already are part of the, the cabinet of the last four years. Are, are you the one that appoints the people that are the judge and jury of what's true and what's not true, of what is and what is not misinformation? If, is that like, 
is just the fact that Elon Musk allows people to have opinions that you don't like on X. Is that misinformation? Should he be held accountable? Should you shut him down like they did in Brazil because people are saying things you don't like? I would say not that long ago previous to this kind of Brazil situation and this little Kamala clip here, Zuckerberg, who is on a side note, gone through quite a alpha male transformation in the past couple of years. I don't know if you've seen that, man. But Brazilian jiu-jitsu will do a number on a dude. I mean, he went from fucking dweeb loser to absolute like giga chad. I don't I don't know what happened. I don't know if you've seen the memes, but dude's fucking whatever whatever his PR team is doing, it's working. Because all of a sudden, like, yo, Zuckerberg's kind of hard though. God damn, look at this. Look at this young blood. Anyways, Zuckerberg came out with a statement, which is a big fucking deal. Like a like a, an actual letter with the meta letterhead that essentially admitted to working with the Biden and Kamala Harris administration to censor real information on meta or not only to censor Americans. The first part was related to COVID-19 content in 2021. Senior officials from the Biden admin, including the White House, repeatedly pressured Zuckerberg's team for months to censor COVID-19 content, including humor and satire and expressed a lot of frustration with our teams when they didn't agree Ultimately, it was, it was their decision to take it down, and they did. They made a bunch of, I mean, and l listen, don't get me wrong. Like, YouTube did this too. I don't know what, you know, no one's going to come out at, at Alphabet or Google and be like, yeah, we also got pressured by the Biden admin to derank and, and absolutely obliterate anything that was negative regarding COVID-19 and the vaccines, et cetera. 100%. Uh, obviously, they did it to more than just Meta, but Zuckerberg's the first one to come out as the CEO and founder of meta and be the first person to be like, yeah, they, they basically were like, they got pissed off that we weren't complying with them, taking down information they didn't like. And I'm not saying that there wasn't a lot of quote unquote misinformation going around during that time, especially with vaccines and stuff. I will say that I, I, I believe that the government is almost wholly and utterly captured by the biggest industries in our country, which are pharmaceutical, big food, and capitalism at its core leads to some pretty pretty impressive situations of what I would consider real misinformation, right? Anyways, let's go on. Um, Mark said he believes the government pressure was wrong and he, re he regrets that at the time he wasn't more outspoken about it. He also thinks that they made some choices that with the benefit of hindsight and new information, he wouldn't make today. He said his teams at the time, they felt strongly that they didn't want to compromise their content standards due to pressure from any administration in either direction. And they're ready to push back if something like this happens again. Now, speaking of misinformation directly related to Kamal in that clip you just saw about holding platforms accountable, we need to hold people accountable for spreading misinformation, quote unquote. In a separate situation, the FBI warned Mark Zuckerberg and Meta about a potential Russian dis a, Ru a potential Russian disinformation operation about the Biden family in Burisma in the lead up to the 2020 election. This is Russian involvement, essentially. That fall, there was a New York Post story reporting on corruption allegations involving then Democratic presidential nominee Biden and his family. They sent the story to fact checkers for review and temporarily demoted it while waiting for a reply. Since then, it was made clear that the reporting was not Rus Russian disinformation. And this is most likely, if I had to guess, he doesn't state this in the actual letter, but probably concerning the Hunter Biden laptop, which has since come out to be 1000% true. <laughs> and it's, and he says, uh, it's since been made clear that the reporting was not Russian, Russian disinformation. And in retrospect, we shouldn't have demoted the story. We've changed our policies and processes to make sure this doesn't happen again. For instance, we no longer temporarily demote things in the US while waiting for fact checkers. That's a pretty big deal for the CEO of one of the biggest social media platforms, one of the biggest disseminators of information on the planet to come out with that statement. It just rubs me in a way that's like, here you have Kamala sitting up there on stage talking about Elon and X and how, you know, we need to hold people accountable for misinformation. It's like, bitch, your fucking administration lied to the American people and tried to demote content that was informing them about the truth. Knowingly. Don't fucking talk to me about holding people accountable for misinformation. Like, 
This is the thing. I get so fucking heated just around politics and all the lip service because everyone's a fucking snake. Everyone's a fucking snake. In my perspective, it's become it's it's so difficult now to to truly if you are a critical thinker who is comfortable tasking themselves with trying to discern what makes sense even if it's something that's uncomfortable for you. We live in an online landscape that has made it very difficult to do that without an investment of a lot of time. I'm shitting particularly in this clip on Kamala and this, you know, the speech and, and just Brazil in general, like the censoring of X and the taking down of X, this idea of like taking away people's ability to freely express themselves because the government thinks they're, uh, well, I don't, they will probably, the, the government wants to make you think that they're, the government will tell you that they're protecting you. They're protecting democracy by controlling what you're allowed to consume. When in reality, what they are doing is protecting their own interests by trying to censor things that you might consume that could jeopardize the power that they hold. That, and that's the truth. And this is Democratic. This is Republican. This is just power corrupting absolutely. That is what it is. So when I want, you know, I see these things and I read this stuff, it, it doesn't surprise me. I have such a jaded view on politics and people in power and just, I would say, government and institutions in general. And I try not to let it really eat up too much of my brain waves and my brain power, too much of my, uh, my bandwidth, because I focus much more on, okay, this shit I have no control over. I'm talking about it to you right now because I do see it. I read about it. I think about it. I see these things online, but what the fuck am I going to do about it? Of course, yeah, you can go and vote. You can vote one way or the other, depending on what you think uh, politically. That's fine. That's a that's that's wonderful. But I think it's such a a ludicrous waste of time it, it, to just sit around and like be stewing and posting and theorizing and cons conspiring all day long about this shit. You might even be right, but like in my personal life, I choose to try and spend that time in a way that is more of an investment in myself, whatever that might be, whether it's uh, d disconnected from the internet with family, building relationships, uh, relaxing, golfing, working, working out, enjoying the outside, hiking, whatever. Like you could just go down the never ending rabbit hole and it can, it can completely capture your personality. And then you become that person that can't be around anyone. Like you're like, oh fuck, Le he, uh, is Leon gonna be there? He won't shut the fuck up about the government. He won't shut the fuck up about X, Y, and Z and Trump and Kamala. It's like, you don't know, you don't want to be that guy. All of those things may be true. Some of the stuff we just talked about, but like, you still kind of don't want to be that guy, right? You got to have a personality outside of like being the dude who's just so wrapped up in this, in the fuck it. And, and you know what? In the defense of someone who might criticize what I just said, there is an element of maybe ignorance is bliss to what I'm talking about right now. Part of me maybe thinks that it's, I've compartmentalized it because I don't really want to know the whole depth of truth because I do think that the history of humanity would show that power in government in leaders through centuries and millenniums are absolutely corrupt. They don't hold the interests of the common man, of you and of I in a regard that matters even a little bit. And that's anytime I see someone up on stage talking some politician and it's like, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that for you. I just like, oh, bro, uh, are you really? Are you really? But the other side of me feels like obligated to, you know, it's like, okay, well, it may not be the best system. It's a broken system. It's a, sh but it's better than a lot of places on earth. Like I'm talking shit about it, but like, God damn, I would rather live in the United States more than anywhere else in the world because at least we're, we're kind of holding out. But I guess that's why people are maybe finding that the stakes feel a little bit higher right now in a way. You see this shit happening in Brazil. Oh, we're just going to take that away from you. We're just going to, oh, here's a place you like to see global news on the ground. Like, and let's be honest, dude, there are like quote unquote misinformation aside or whatever the fuck. Like if you spend any considerable amount of time on places like X or like maybe Reddit's not the best example. There is no doubt that the fastest breaking news around global events happens on these websites. Legacy media, like, forget it. It's a joke. You're like, nobody's tuning in to like the five o'clock news to see what's going on in the world unless you're like 70. 
unless you or you're like a 68 year old lonely cat woman that like doesn't own a phone like no shit's breaking and happening all the time and it's it's in a weird way it's like it's fucked up because it almost breaks the human brain like i i miss the days where it was like i didn't have to be plugged in at all time and i knew nothing of what the fuck was going on in the world and then i'd flip on the news like once a week or it would be on in the background while i was at my friend's house and we were playing pogs and there'd be like one sad story and then they'd end the news with a happy story and be like man life is good and now it's like you pull out your phone and 30 minutes later you're like the world's going to end we're spiraling the drain this is the worst time to be alive. <laughs> right? It's like this fucking, but the reality is that's not true. We just have a different lens to view the world through now where it's coming at us at light speed. Every horrible thing going on on the planet is now being pumped into our brains at light speed as it's happening. That needs to be talked about more. The human brain is not equipped to deal with that level of partitioning of information. And to be able to deal with that emotionally, whether it's content that's jarring or disgusting or ha like, it's just a very, it's a new paradigm in how we consume. And, it, you know, I say new, I mean, decade and a half, two decades now on a larger time frame of human evolution, a little speck of sand, right? You're talking 15, 20 years is a very small amount of time and that's not a lot of time for the human brain to adapt. And so what we've kind of seen, I think downstream of this is this level of frenzy from people, this level of heightened division and this level of tribalism that I think is a little, you know, has is unprecedented at least in my lifetime. So I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's a solution, but I do not think that the solution is censorship and taking away people's ability to share and consume information. Since this whole thing in Brazil, the, the communication regulatory body of the United States essentially drafted a letter to Brazil. And they were basically like, they had, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but they were like, hey, we have a longstanding relationship we, that's founded on respect for the rule of law and independence and reciprocity and blah, blah, blah. We think what you're doing is fucked up. And not only did Brazil block access to X, they froze Starlink's assets, Starlink licenses in Brazil. And Starlink is unrelated to X, I think, you know, in, in many ways. Starlink is a, a satellite internet service provider. You guys are probably familiar. So it feels like they were just like, I don't know if they were just like anti-Elon or anything he had to do. Maybe he was saying some stuff that was not in the best interest of the current political party in power in Brazil. Again, I, I don't know. I didn't follow the situation too closely, but I also don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to like let Elon off the hook too. I think there is an element of responsibility that comes with having a unfathomably large audience capture or audience capture is not the right word, just audience in general. And I don't know, but that it, it, it's, it's, it's the nature of, of how the world works now. There's always going to be people now and forever moving forward that are going to have a massive audience online that follows them and watches them and is interested in what they do and what they say. The Rock, celebrities, social media influencers, Elon Musk. Obviously, there's levels to this game, Elon being one of probably the most followed and prolific people on the planet. And certainly you have a responsibility, but at the same time, like, you should still be allowed to say what you believe to be objectively true. And that's what I think Elon is doing. I don't think he's saying anything with the intention of inciting violence or, or, or hate as the word is thrown around all the time. It's, oh, if you don't, if you're not completely on board with whatever this particular progressive ideology is, that you must just be filled with hate. That's a whole nother conversation I won't get into. But I, I do personally think that Elon is just trying to, I would say, just find some sort of objective truth. And that's the problem is that, that that's a very controversial matter. What is objectively true? Some things that we thought were objectively true for years are not so much anymore in the, uh, in the public discourse. Um, so things can get a little bit hairy. But the problem, like when you talk about what's objectively true and then what's misinformation, quote unquote, again is the term misinformation it's it's kind of like been reduced to this you know this nomenclature that is a way to describe 
something on the internet that feels icky and uncomfortable because it doesn't align with your ideologies or particular political leanings, right? Can you ever get to the bottom of that? I mean, you're talking about, I, what was, I think the, I think the administration, the current administration created like uh, back with the old Twitter before Elon bought it, they had like a, a trust it, like some sort of misinformation, some sort of committee that was essentially supposed to be in charge of deciding what was misinformation or not. Like that just reeks to me, that just reeks of <laughs> corruption. And listen, you guys know this, like I lean conservative, but like if there was a conservative in the office and they were like, yeah, we need to, we need to have a committee to decide what's allowed to be disseminated online and what's true and what's not. And we'll censor things that we think I would be so against that hundred percent, but you don't, it, you don't really, I don't feel like I'm seeing that really from the conservatives. Generally, the idea is more like ideas need a chance to exist and have a battle in the marketplace of ideas. The point I'm trying to make is I've over the past couple of years had a few tweets online, a few instances where I've tried to champion free speech. In fact, one of them was when Andrew Tate got deplatformed. And you guys know I had a, I did an episode on Andrew Tate two or three weeks ago. If you listen to this at all, you know how I feel about him. Not a fan of who he is, not a fan of his character. I understand the entertainment value that he offers, blah, 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 but think he's ultimately a fucking absolute piece of shit. But when he got deplatformed, I was vocal about that being, I don't like using the word slippery slope because it feels a little bit cliche, but it being unjust. I don't think just because you are saying things that people find offensive or you're saying things that could influence people in a certain way. Like there needs to be a battle in the arena of ideas. Okay. If what Andrew Tate is saying is so offensive and so bad, let someone else say something that makes more sense and capture that. You can't just delete somebody off the internet and pretend like it's going to go away. And we've seen that it's the Streisand effect. It, like there's a, there was a thing called, there was these three defenses of free speech. I was reading an article earlier and one of the second points was that silencing offensive speech can unintentionally give more attention to the speaker. And in Andrew Tate's case, that exactly what, that's exactly what that did. hundred percent. It's the Streisand effect. It's like you, if you want something to not exist, if you try to censor it and you try to delete it and pretend like it doesn't exist, people are going to be more interested in that thing. Why are we not allowed to consume this? Why am I not allowed? Why is he not allowed? You know, what is he saying that is so bad or so important or so, you know what I mean? It just feels very obvious why that it, you're, you're actually heightening the attention on that particular thing. This is kind of, in, in kind of related to Brazil. This is an, an interesting example after they, they, they banned X and were like, yeah, if you're going to be using, if, if we catch you using a VPN, you're going to be fined however many $9,000 an hour or something obscene. And I saw online after that time, it started trending and basically everyone was like, yeah, I just went for people either that had VPNs or people that were like, I just uh, ordered a VPN and I'm just going to be connecting to Brazil at all times. So their idea was like, yeah, they're, we're just going to fuck them by this kind of stress and effective. Like they don't want people on X and they don't want people using VPNs to access X. Well, now everyone in the world was like, hey, let's just all get a VPN and connect to Brazilian VPNs. I don't know if that works or how that works. I don't, the idea was kind of funny, but it, it kind of plays to that point of, you know, you're trying to silence something and instead you're drawing more attention to it. People want what they can't have. It's kind of that forbidden fruit. That, that forbidden fruit. You tell me, you tell me I can't have it. Well, I'm going to spend extra energy trying to figure out how to get it. In regards to free speech and anti-censorship, uh, the pursuit of knowledge requires the competition of multiple perspectives. And as I just mentioned a moment ago, it's kind of this marketplace of ideas philosophy. There was an English philosopher named James Stuart Mill, and he argued that the best test of truth was to allow people with different ideas to compete with one another. Truth may not immediately win out in the marketplace, but repeated encounters with a variety of viewpoints encourages people to think critically rather than accepting whatever idea is just handed to them. Even flawed or incomplete opinions were valuable. 
Mill argued, because they could be used to gain a clearer perception and livelier impression of the truth. Now, I, I love that quote from John Mill. I think this idea that the repeated encounters with a variety of viewpoints encourages people to think critically rather than accepting whatever idea is handed to them. I think that is beautiful. And I think that one of the biggest downfalls of, I don't want to say of social media, but almost one of like one of the intrinsic flaws of human nature is, is to too willingly accept an idea that is handed down to you if it aligns with what you've been raised on or what you believe. There needs to be contrarian opinions and there needs to be challenges. I would say that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that I believe to be objectively true. And I'm happy to have those ideas challenged. And they are quite frankly, often challenged in some of the things online. And I try to give myself room to inventory and re-audit why I believe those things that I do. And, you know, there's definitely been things I've changed my mind on over the years. I mean, certainly in a lot of ways, again, some of you guys that have listened to me know how I was, I was raised very Christian and religious and I'm, I'm a little bit more agnostic now, but I still hold a lot of conservative values, but I'm constantly asking myself, why, why do you believe this? Why do you believe this to be the right way to live? Why do you believe this to be true? I think that's important. And so this idea that we're just going to uh, censor or, or, or if someone's saying something that I don't like, like we don't, we just can't have those. We're not, we can't really have those things being said because they make people feel uncomfortable or sad or they're offensive words hurt, like all this shit, like get the fuck out of here, dude. Like, I'm not going to pretend like there aren't situations where actual misinformation and lies and words and people, the audiences that do things vitriolic and harmful can be a net negative. That is that is an unfortunate side effect of how information is distributed these days and especially people with large audiences, how they use their platforms and how they use their words. I don't think the solution in the answer is to try and delete these people from the internet and try to censor them. I just don't. That's I just think it is a morally imperative initiative to protect everyone's ability to free expression. And the unfortunate part of that is there are just really shitty individuals that will find a way to have a voice and say some shit that's very unfortunate or evil. Uh, you know, you could go down the list. There's always going to be those people, but we can't just pretend like they don't exist. We need to beat them with better ideas and more pure, not pure is not the right word, just better ideas, better examples better role models of of what it means to live uh, uh, a valuable life. And that's not always easy. Sometimes it feels like some of the bad have a megaphone and the good people are just kind of living their life not on the internet. But I just, I, I really like this idea of, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen over the next three or four months, man, five months. I'm not like a doomer. I don't think that if like whatever way the election goes, I don't think the country's going to end. But I do think that every superpower has its heyday and then things start to slowly trickle. I do think there is an element of, let me back up for a second. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the, like in the part of Twitter and X that is ideologically captured by decentralized governance and um, kind of the network state idea that is the eventuality of what we're living through right now, which is kind of, you know, state power, government power. And as I think what we've seen over the, over most of our lifetimes is the government losing power as they lose their ability to control the narrative and control information in the last 20 or 30 years as the technological boom has happened. And it feels like there's been a mask off moment and they're just kind of frantically doing whatever they can to keep this shit together. And a lot of people are just kind of like, eh, well, the cat's out of the bag. There's no way of putting the cat back in. And they're trying to figure out how to kind of wrangle the horses back up. And it's just not going to happen. So there is an element for me that feels like things could get a little spicy. You know, I don't think it's going to be fucking the last of us too, like eating cans of beans and running from zombies and hiding in sewers with 
with that with with AKs, but I just think that th- this kind of unprecedented uh, S curve of of technological innovation, uh, inter- information information consumption, the connectedness of the entire global market with social media and all these things, I think they have really just changed the world in a way that w- is never going back. So you know, the, e- even in the '90s and in, in the era I grew up in, that's like a distant hollow past that is almost unrecognizable now. And there's a lot of nostalgia from me. And I know a lot of people that are probably my age that miss that era because there is a bit of rose colored goggles going on when you look back and you remember all the great things. There was obviously shitty stuff that was happening at the time too. But um, moving forward, yeah, I just think this, I think the idea of individual sovereignty is important. That's why I've always been a big, I've been a big fan of cryptocurrency in general, aside from what the lay person typically thinks of as like the scams and the pump and dumps and all the bullshit, the ethos that is the foundation of crypto is kind of this decentralized ownership of something, which you you just don't have in, in this country. You don't own anything. You you buy a house, you spend a, hundreds of thousand dollars on a house, you can own it outright. Guess what? If you don't pay your taxes, the government takes it. You don't really own anything right? Of value. And that is one of the reasons why I've really been interested in kind of the cypherpunk uh, crypto mindset is it's like, well, this is a, this is a network, the bit, just speaking of Bitcoin in general, this is a network that is run. It's a globally run decentralized network that you can own a piece of, and nobody can take that from you. you like you can hide it from what, like the government would have to literally come and, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's just that's a different rabbit hole, but it's it all kind of it all kind of is under the same umbrella, the free speech, the individual sovereignty, the what do you actually own? What is actually yours and how, how much how much of what you own could just be taken in a heartbeat <laughs> if the government decided they wanted it, right? You look around the world, this shit happens all the time. And then, you know, you look at Brazil and they're like, well, now we own your ability to, to we're trying to own the ability, your ability of uh, what you're allowed to consume and you're not allowed to consume anything on X right now. And that's how it starts. And who knows? I'm not sure what it's going to look like uh, in this country in the next three months, one year, five years, 10 years. I do know that although I have reservations about some of these things that we've spoken about today, I'm very grateful to live in this country because I love it. And there's so much beauty and so many wonderful people and so much, so much to, so much to gain from looking at your life through a lens of optimism. I truly believe that. So while I do sit here and I talk about these things that concern me uh, and just government overreach and, and individual liberties uh, things that matter to me on a personal level, I think you have to balance that with a a lens of optimism because there is so much untapped potential in this world. M- mo- I'm speaking mostly inside of ourselves and, and really it comes down to, so much of life comes down to how you view the world and your perspective on your life and your ability to to make a dent and do things that are important. And uh, I truly believe that. And so I hope that, I hope that this little rant today was, you know, whatever it was, maybe you learned, maybe you learned a little bit about me uh, and maybe it sparked a, something in you that uh, you didn't know was there. Um, and as always, I'd love to hear any comments or anything you have to say about this uh, down below, or um, if you're listening <laughs> in your car or on the shitter, just say it out loud and I'll hear you through ESP. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you guys next week. Uh, and as always stay, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a tagline. I don't have a tagline yet. And I don't want a tagline that starts with stay. So just have a good weekend. See you later. Peace.